As long as humans have existed, we've told stories to survive. Stories about finding happiness, about not dying in the wilderness, stories about overcoming hardships. We tell stories to teach lessons and to confront the unknown. When the monsters that lurk in the dark threaten our safety and our peace of mind, we turn to our stories for advice and comfort. And entropy is no different. But just as we use stories to deal with all the decay around us, that decay has a tricky way of dealing with our stories, too. Maybe it's some morbid fascination with death and dilapidation, or maybe it's a reaction to existential dread. One way or another, many of the tales we tell, for lack of a better term, are stories about entropy. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. A shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs while all about it reel shadows of the indignant desert birds. And what rough beast its hour come round at last slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. What I've just read are selections from a poem written in 1919 titled The Second Coming by William Butler Yeats. You've probably read it at some point in school, but to this day it continues to be one of the most haunting things I've ever read. Yeats wrote this poem after the conclusion of a global war that redefined man's capacity to destroy. He looked around at the decayed hellscape of a planet that surrounded him, and he wrote down what he saw. He called it the second coming, but what it foretold was far from Christ-like. Yeats' vision of the world was an apocalyptic nightmare filled with death and decay. As I said, this poem stuck with me. There's something about the bleak pictures the poem conjures, a sphinx-like creature slouching towards Bethlehem, and a blood-dimmed tide drowning a ceremony of innocence that shook me. The poem is morose, to say the least, but the part of the poem that haunts me most is how resigned Yeats sounds in it. Like someone who's given up, and accepted the decay of everything around them as inescapable. In fact, Yeats' apocalyptic vision of the Second Coming might not be too far off from reality, and it illuminates one of the terrible truths of our universe. Just a few decades before Yeats wrote The Second Coming, the scientific field of thermodynamics was blooming. Contributions from the likes of Boltzmann, Clausius, and Kelvin helped to uncover a force powerful enough to explain not only the problems of thermodynamics, but to explain the great decay that was beginning to spread its fingers across the globe. The same decay that the Second Coming foretells. The single combining force that powers both our engines and our demise was given a name. Entropy. For as seemingly crucial as entropy is to our understanding of the universe, it's a notoriously difficult concept to explain. And it's here that I want to give a disclaimer or two. First, I'm not a scientist. I find entropy and all its applications to be supremely interesting, but I also have no formal education in thermodynamics whatsoever. Now, I've done my fair share of research before even attempting to write this essay. Heck, I even read a book for you guys, to try and do the topic justice but please keep in mind here that I'm no expert. And also, please uh, don't come at me in the comments saying that I'm making claims that aren't scientific. I, I know they're not scientific uh, because this is not a scientific paper. Second, I'm going to be discussing a pretty eclectic variety of works in this video, so if you don't want any of these fine stories spoiled for you, I'd maybe recommend taking a rain check on the essay. Now, back to the topic at hand. So what is entropy anyways? It all comes back to the second law of thermodynamics. The second law tells us that all natural processes of the universe are accompanied by an increase in entropy. Other ways of saying this are that heat cannot flow from a cold source to a hot source spontaneously, or that we can't convert heat into usable work with perfect efficiency. 
but in my opinion, the easiest way of grasping both entropy and the second law is by stating that in natural processes, heat tends to disperse. And with that dispersal of heat comes an increase in entropy. Let's start with an ordinary example. What happens when you pour cream into your coffee in the morning? It spreads out from where it was poured in and disperses throughout the coffee. You didn't do anything to make the cream move that way, it just does. That tendency for the cream to disperse chaotically through the coffee, to become disorderly, is entropy in a nutshell. Or look at combining a cup of hot water and a cup of cold water together in a tub. The hot water in its cup is isolated. It's in a high quality, low entropy state. The cold water too is in a low entropy state. When we mix them, we know that the hot water will spread out through the container and the temperature of the final mixture will be somewhere between the original hot and cold. Through no outside influence, the heat of the hot water disperses and the entropy of the container increases. And you'll notice that this process never seems to occur in reverse. A bucket of lukewarm water on its own won't spontaneously separate out into hot and cold, just like our cream and coffee from earlier. I'm willing to bet that your cup of coffee never spontaneously separated out into the black coffee and the cream, or that your egg has ever unscrambled. I could list a bunch of examples, but what it comes down to is that wherever things tend to disperse, an increase in entropy is sure to be found. And once that process is done, it won't naturally undo itself. And it's for this reason that many scientists have coined entropy as time's arrow, since it seems to dictate the natural direction in which things tend to move. The fact that time marches forward, and entropy will always be increasing alongside it, are some of the only universal truths that we have. The increase of entropy is the irreversible melding together of things, the breaking of barriers that cannot be naturally rebuilt. The melting cube of ice will naturally decay, and so will we. What are humans but a tightly packed bundle of energy that can think? Like all other bundles of energy, entropy will eventually unwind us as well. I mean, look at what happens to us after we die. We literally break down our energy spreading into the earth as nutrients. The second law of thermodynamics takes on a wildly different, morose feeling from this understanding. The entropy of our universe can only increase. Disorder, chaos, and decay are inevitable, and they are scientifically certain to only get worse over time. Eventually, it's why our little corner of the universe will come to an end, when the energy of the sun disperses in the form of a supernova. Entropy pervades all aspects of our life. It's why good things must come to an end. The low entropy state of life with clearly isolated good and evil will inevitably fade, and we are all thrown into the chaotic fray of compounding disorder. Just like the coffee and cream or the cube of ice, over time our moral pillars erode. Crime rises, the climate decays the planet, and there's nothing we can do in the long term to escape it. Entropy is why things fall apart. If you don't mind, I'd like to take you back to the 1890s. You see, at the end of the 19th century and the dawn of the 20th, the world found itself at a turning point. The Industrial Revolution irreversibly changed the structure of society, while Nietzsche and the Nihilists proclaimed for the first time that not only was God dead, but that we had killed him. Meanwhile, in the nation of Nigeria, a land with an unbelievably rich and unique cultural background, the Igbo people found their traditional ways of life uprooted with the arrival of European missionaries. The religious and agricultural practices centered around worship and harvest were forcefully uprooted and supplanted by a warlike Christianity that sought to tear down all who resisted its spread. Some members of the Igbo freely joined the Christians, while others clung to the ashes of their culture, forever fighting the degradation of their way of life. Decades later, a Nigerian writer by the name of Chinwa Achibe would go on to write a novel chronicling the conquest of the English and the decay of the Igbo in a book appropriately titled Things Fall Apart. And just as the title suggests, 
Things Fall Apart reflects not only the entropic catastrophe that the Nigerians faced in real life, but it also tells a uniquely personal story of entropy within its narrative. The story of Things Fall Apart centers around Okonkwo, a well-respected leader of an Igbo tribe, and the continued trials he faces throughout his life, as well as his greater struggle to preserve his tribe amidst the invasion of English missionaries. The setting of the novel, the real-life occupation of Nigeria during the late 1800s, is a testament to the forces of entropy at work throughout our history. Prior to the events that are depicted in Things Fall Apart, England and Nigeria were two very distinct nations, entirely drawn apart from one another, both geographically and culturally. But when industry and the drive to expand pushed the English to invade, we began to see entropy at work. Just as the boundaries between hot and cold water or coffee and cream disappear when they're mixed, the wall of isolation that protected the Igbo was reduced to rubble under the foot of the English missionaries. As seen in the novel, the Igbo way of life is all but destroyed. Traditional practices and customs are replaced by Christian churches, and the English prop up their own government alongside the Igbo leaders. Many of the tribe's young men are recruited by the English, leaving behind a dilapidated husk of the once robust Igbo village. And the fact that such a devastating, yet classically entropic story has become a classic piece of modern literature speaks to the impact that entropy has on us on a cultural level. Forever exonerated in the form of Achibe's writing, Things Fall Apart is a reminder of the forces of decay that constantly threaten to destroy our culture. Okonkwo, the story's main character, is a paragon of the characteristics that were valued in pre-conquest Igbo culture. He is strong, courageous, and stoic to a fault. His strength inspires fear in the hearts of his family members and companions, and he is seen as one of the champions of his village. But as things fall apart displays so clearly, even the strongest of men must eventually succumb to the destructive tides of entropy. Okonkwo faces the storm in front of him, and demonstrates the first of many possible actions one may take when they find themselves face to face with entropy. Okonkwo, in the novel's finale, takes his own life. After continuous struggles and continuous failures against the invasion, Okonkwo gives up. He accepts the inevitability of what's ahead of him and chooses to run towards entropy rather than be trampled by it. We turn to our stories for answers, though the solution each story provides will not always be the same, nor will they always be hopeful. Entropy comes for the Igbo in the form of colonization. Okonkwo eventually meets it in the form of suicide. But whether Okonkwo had decided to fight the English to the bitter end or not, the result would be the same. No matter how hard you struggle or how prosperous you are, even our mightiest leaders must succumb to entropy eventually. But while reading things fall apart, you can't help but wonder, what if Okonkwo had fought back just a little harder? What if he struggled just a little bit longer? Surely there must be some way to resist entropy even slightly, right? By the time Breaking Bad was entering its fifth season, fans of the show had a pretty good idea that things wouldn't turn out alright for the chemistry teacher turned meth emperor Walter White. Over the last five seasons, Walt's exploits had grown exponentially. He had transformed from being a small-time meth dealer working out of a trailer in the middle of nowhere to Heisenberg, the undisputed king of the meth world. Having even displaced the cold and calculating Gus Fring, Walt stood alone at the top. But the climb to the top of the mountain where Walt stands during the show's final season left him a monster. Along with his success, Walt's animosity and ruthlessness grew alongside it. Going so far as to poison an innocent child, Walt paid the ultimate cost for the building of his empire, his humanity. What drove Walter White to such heights of success and such depths of depravity? Walter White, like all of us, was struck with the inevitable and yet unfailingly devastating blow of entropy. Now, unlike Okonkwo, Walt didn't start out at the top of his game. Rather, Walt was already on the decline. But the series' inciting incident, a terminal lung cancer diagnosis, pushed Walt over the edge. As entropy seeped in, crumbling the pillars of his life and threatening not only his immediate health, 
but also the long-term security of his family, Walt faced a similar choice to Oconquo. But rather than running towards entropy with open arms, Walt rejects this universal decay. He chooses instead to build up something new from the rubble of his current life. He, somewhat ironically, cloaks himself in chaos and unpredictability through his criminal namesake, Heisenberg, the founder of the Uncertainty Principle. And having come face to face with unpredictability and chaos in its purest form, Walt starts to build his new life out of the ashes, his final attempt to fight off entropy. Now, by the second law, we know it to be undeniably true that the entropy of the universe can only increase. We know that heat cannot flow from cold to hot. We know that heat cannot be transferred into work. Entropy only increases. And despite this, we still have refrigerators whose entire function is to transfer heat from a cold to a hot source. They seem to fly directly in the face of the second law. But you see, on a local scale, we can decrease the entropy of a system, so long as the entropy of the universe at large is still increasing. The entropy inside the refrigerator may be decreasing, yes, but the entropy outside of the universe is increasing as the refrigerator has to draw on electricity to run a dispersal of heat. Walter White, when faced with the entropic problem of a cancer diagnosis, becomes his own refrigerator, in a sense. He establishes his meth gig, he builds up his business into an empire with the help of Jesse, Mike, Saul, and many more. As we said, by the time the fifth season started airing, Walt stood at the top. He was able to successfully transform the chaos of his own situation into an orderly, new, constructed empire. But just like with the refrigerator, there had to have been a greater cost somewhere behind the scenes. Walt decreases the entropy of his own life, but at the cost of an increase somewhere else. His family. As Walt built up his criminal empire throughout the series, he continuously shirked off the cost of his actions to those around him. He irreparably damages his marriage with Skylar, becomes estranged from his son, and time and time again inflicts unimaginable pain on Jesse Pinkman. Though Walt builds up his impenetrable fortress, he is simultaneously tearing down the connections he has with nearly everyone else in his life. Walt's tragic flaw, and ultimately what leads to his empire crumbling, is his ignorance of the hidden costs of his actions. It's only when Hank uncovers Walt's true identity as Heisenberg that he's forced to begin to accept the reality of his situation. In the penultimate episode of Breaking Bad, titled Ozymandias, we finally get to see Walter White succumb to the entropy he'd been eluding up until now. This infamous episode is named after a classic poem by Percy B. Shelley. The poem tells of the dilapidated ruins of a statue in the desert. The statue is of a once great king named Ozymandias, and an inscription among the rubble reads, My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. But just like its namesake suggests, Ozymandias shows Walt's kingdom crumble into dust around him, as we see the fallout of five seasons worth of abuse and struggle. Walt loses Hank, his family member, and is estranged from the rest of his family. His castle comes crashing down all at once. And though Walt manages to tie up many of his loose ends in the series finale, he is ultimately unable to save himself. Now, it might just seem like I'm looking at any story where bad things happen and saying, it's all about entropy. After all, just about every story ever has some sort of conflict or downward turn of events. It wouldn't be interesting otherwise. But the thing is, in most stories, that conflict is resolved by the end. In these stories about entropy, however, there is no happy ending. Things don't get better. Ever. Because that's just not how entropy works, unfortunately. Walter White doesn't get to turn it all around at the last second and get a happy ending for himself or his family. Same with Oconquo. Things only go from good to bad to worse to terrible. And as we know, once entropy starts to decay things, there's no going back. With the death of Walter White, along with the state of those he left behind, it begs one to wonder if it was all worth it. Sure, Walt managed to fend off entropy and preserve his life for an extra year or two, and he even managed to build something that's undeniably pretty impressive along the way. 
but only at the cost of destroying everything and everyone around him, and eventually, himself. Just as Things Fall Apart showed how entropy can break people down to the point of no return, Breaking Bad shows its audience that while you can evade entropy all you like, you can't run forever. Up until now, we've only really discussed entropy inside of our stories. Okonkwo and Walter White both succumb to entropy, and their stories are realistic in this regard, but they're both ultimately fiction. What's interesting about the decay of stories through entropy is that not only do the stories themselves start to crumble, as we've seen, but the very structures and mediums we use to tell these stories crumble as well. For a long time, most of the stories of the Western world, and the Western world is just what I'm most familiar with, but there's a whole wide world of stories out there with varying structures and themes and styles that are just as interesting and distinct as the ones we're already familiar with. Go learn something new. Have abided by a set of rules. For a while, they went unspoken, but the likes of Joseph Campbell did a great deal to uncover these structures that acted as the framework for our stories. I'm sure you've heard of The Hero's Journey by now. It's become an incredibly popular topic amongst creatives since Campbell coined the term in his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. But by now, there are two things that we know to be true of entropy. First, entropy impacts everything. And second, if there's one thing that entropy excels at, it's breaking down structures. So really, it's no surprise that as time has marched forward, and we've gone from the modern to the postmodern, and now to the post-postmodern, it really shouldn't be surprising that entropy has gone to work on our story structures and the way we tell them. For example, traditionally, it's pretty much been a given that in our stories, time moves linearly, in one direction. It almost feels redundant to point that out. Like, look everyone, time behaves as it always has. Well, of course it does, how else would time possibly behave? But since the modern era, this isn't always the case. Look no further than another classic modern novel, Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five. Time practically behaves in every possible manner except the usual one in Slaughterhouse-Five. The opening line reads rather unceremoniously, Billy Pilgrim has come unstuck in time. Framed around World War II, another colossal, entropic lurch into chaos, Slaughterhouse-Five actively breaks down conventions of structure and of time itself. It's a little ironic when you think about it. We've talked about the idea of entropy being time's arrow, and here we are reaching the point where even time is breaking down in our stories. Entropy breaks down entropy. I just think it's funny. Not only structure and linear time are broken either. The boundaries of genre, medium, and even the lines between the story and the audience have been broken down as well. The once occasionally tampered with boundary between the audience and the story known as the fourth wall has been completely obliterated. Consider some of the video games that have been coming out in the last five years. Doki Doki Literature Club, an indie horror game that was making big waves a few years back, breaks boundaries of genre while utterly shattering the fourth wall. The game flawlessly blurs the line between dating simulator and psychological horror. The characters in the story interact with you. And not you meaning your character, but you, the person playing the game. The story becomes alive, with characters deleting one another from the narrative and rewriting the story itself. It's total madness, and it's totally entropy. Undertale, another wildly popular indie game, similarly breaks the boundaries of what used to be possible in video games by redefining many of the benign game mechanics like saving and combat, and it turns them into story elements with in-universe applications. Experience, or EXP, becomes execution points. Saving becomes a sort of meta in-universe power system with alternating timelines. It breaks down not only conventions of genre, but conventions of video games as a whole. And this all to me is an interesting, beautiful consequence of entropy. Entropy is a terribly scary thing, no doubt. It tears down everything in its path, but on the way, there's some real beauty born from the chaos. Stories like those found in Doki Doki Literature Club, Undertale, or Slaughterhouse-Five would never have come to be if not for the opportunity for innovation brought about by entropy. The breaking of barriers can be a bad thing, but it also allows for creativity, freedom, and innovation. 
And so before we step into the end game of our reflection on entropy, I think it's been worth taking a step back to realize that like everything, entropy is a two-sided coin. So here we are. We've seen the creativity, the freedom, and the innovation that can come from entropy. We've seen how it can push boundaries of storytelling and pave the way for new and unique stories, but we've also seen how it can and will tear us all down. We still face our original problem. Is there a hope for Yeats in the world he described back in the Second Coming? Entropy is everywhere. It will come for all of us without fail. We've seen that we can run towards it or we can pitifully struggle against it. Neither one of these responses, though, grants us much consolation in the grand scheme of things. We will all have to face the storm of entropy at some point, whether we want to or not. But still, we run from it. We search for ways to stay forever young. For most of us, we try to live our lives not thinking about our eventual decay. But this frame of mind, like all things, will fall apart, and we'll have to face the music. It comes down to one central question. What is the right thing to do when facing entropy? Our stories have given us plenty of cautionary tales, plenty of what not to do's, but what do we do when it comes for us and everyone we love? We stand unshaken. Red Dead Redemption 2 is not a game I initially thought I would come to for moral answers to the existential problem of entropy. The game, in its story, tries time and again to warn the player that it isn't moral, in fact. Do not seek absolution, warns one questline. But here we are. Rockstar Games' Red Dead Redemption 2 tells the story of a band of outlaws trying to survive amidst the end of the Wild West. Throughout the story, the gang continuously attempts to score one last big hit so they can escape to a fantastical paradise in some open country, but these attempts fail time and again, each with more disastrous consequences than the last. At the outset of the story, we are introduced to the Vanderlyn gang not as criminals and outlaws, but as a family. Following their patriarchal leader and namesake Dutch Vanderlyn, the contrast between our gang and the enemy factions of RDR2 become immediately clear. They are gunmen for hire, and we are a family that sticks out for one another. From coming together to survive terrible snowstorms in the mountains during the game's introduction, to habitually donating their own supplies for the good of the camp, the members of the Vanderlyn gang are just nice. They're all pleasant to talk to, more or less, with unique backgrounds and relationships with one another that clearly run much deeper than what's presented in the game. In the beginning, the Vanderlyns are tightly bound together, isolated from the chaotic mess of the changing world around them. I said the Vanderlyn gang was nice, and the first few chapters of the game keep this up. They're spent mainly performing benign odd jobs and getting into some zany gunfights and brawls. It's largely innocent, idyllic cowboy action. You can retrieve requests for your campmates, perform small-time robberies with them, and just spend time hanging around camp with your family of outlaws. Not to mention that your playable character Arthur Morgan, one of the leaders of the gang and the effective son of Dutch, is an absolute delight to play as. You, sir, are a fish. <clears throat> but things get rather messy with the Vanderlyn gang a few chapters in. While attempting to exploit a conflict between warring plantation families, the Vanderlyn gang's manipulations are discovered, and they begin the slow decline that will ultimately result in their undoing. Arthur is kidnapped and tortured, Sean, a beloved member of the gang, is killed, and Jack, the only child living among the Vanderlyns, is kidnapped. And from here, things only go from bad to worse. It becomes clear that Dutch's illusions of grandeur are only getting more and more severe as he continues to put the gang in increasingly compromising positions for the sake of getting that last score. Heists go wrong, the gang is betrayed by those they once considered allies, and all the while Dutch is only dreaming of farming mangoes in Tahiti. 
After a failed bank robbery that results in the deaths of even more of your beloved family, Arthur, Dutch, Micah, and a few other gang members find themselves stranded on the desert island of Guarma. Once back on the mainland, the final chapter of the game begins to accelerate much more quickly. Entropy has clearly been at play up until now, but it's at this point that the slow collisions turn into an all-out train wreck. Arthur Morgan, who by this point we've been playing as for dozens of hours, is diagnosed with tuberculosis. And this moment changes everything. Things with the Vanderlins have been decaying for quite some time, but Arthur was always hesitant, always standing outside, criticizing the decline of Dutch and the Vanderlins, but begrudgingly going along out of loyalty. But with the diagnosis of Arthur's terminal illness, the external increase of entropy is magnified into a much more immediate and personal threat. The gang was always going to spoil, but now it's been given an expiration date. And things move pretty quickly from here on out. Dutch gets the gang involved in even more needlessly risky plots, newcomer Micah continues to feed Dutch's paranoia, and many of the remaining gang members either die or desert. When things eventually reach the breaking point, Arthur gives up his life to make time for John Marston to escape with his family, while Dutch and Micah go their separate ways. The Vanderlyn gang as we know it has died, utterly reduced to mere rubble, leaving behind a trail of traumatized survivors and broken bonds. What went wrong? Why did it all have to end like this? For fans of the game, it's easy to blame Micah as the one solely responsible for the undoing of the Vanderlyns, but like in real life, the reason why things fall apart is often bigger than any one person. Sure, Micah expedited the process, but the game is overly clear that the Vanderlins were one of the last of their kind. The text at the beginning of the game's opening cutscene reads, By 1899, the age of outlaws and gunslingers was at an end. Regardless of whether or not Micah was there, the world simply wasn't made for outlaws like the Vanderlins anymore. Just like how the arrival of the English in Nigeria largely stamped out the Igbo culture, the settling of the West almost guaranteed that outlaws would be snuffed out. And this is clearly seen throughout the game. Many of the side quests available to you are bounty hunting missions where you actively contribute to the settling of the West and the decay of the outlaw lifestyle. Though Micah was perhaps the catalyst of the gang's demise, the world and story of Red Dead Redemption 2 never shy away from the fact that what the Vanderlins had could never last. Just as entropy dictates, the outlaw lifestyle, like all things, will decay into nothing, and the Vanderlyn gang disintegrates along with it. This may all sound like a carbon copy of the other major stories of entropy we've looked at so far, and to some extent it is. Since entropy is so universal, it figures that entropic stories will generally follow that same structure of decay. But Red Dead Redemption 2 handles this decline in a way that's unique from our other examples. Whereas things fall apart and Breaking Bad are ultimately tragedies, Red Dead Redemption 2 has a distinctly hopeful ending. And it all comes back to Arthur Morgan, and his reaction to the entropy dealt to him. Arthur Morgan, confronted by both his own mortality and the destruction of his family, faces the same dilemma that Okonkwo did, the same one that Walt did. It would have been easy at this point for Arthur to throw up his hands and give up. The age of the outlaw was coming to an end after all, or he could have walked away from it all. A terminal illness is the perfect excuse to leave the criminal life behind. Arthur could have settled down and enjoyed the last of his days in peace and quiet like his doctor suggested. But Arthur does neither of these. He's too selfless for that. He knows that he's indebted to his family and has a responsibility to try and protect them as long as he can. To focus on your own life when you have so little of it left to enjoy, from Arthur's perspective, would be selfish. Similarly, to go along with the flow of entropy, tail between your legs, would be the peak of cowardice. Arthur, with all odds stacked against him, with everything he knows crashing in around him, stands up, unafraid and pledges to do as much good as he can in the time he has left. As the chorus of Unshaken, one of the main musical pieces featured in Red Dead Redemption 2, proclaims, the real question of entropy is not whether or not you should run, but how can you gather the courage to stand? The fresh of world. 
The climactic missions and crazy gunfights are certainly a height of Red Dead Redemption 2's final chapter, but the real meat of it to me were all the opportunities you get to make amends and to help others. The quest line where you teach a widow how to support herself in the woods was honestly one of the best in the game in my opinion, and aside from that, you can forgive people's debts, encourage your friends to leave the gang before things get ugly, and even help out the family of the man who you contracted tuberculosis from. It's honestly pretty profound. Arthur is given more than enough reason to be bitter. Between contracting a terminal illness, losing countless loved ones, and being stranded on a desert island, Arthur Morgan should be very justifiably resentful. And yet, in spite of all that, Arthur shows us that the proper response to all the terrible entropy that you might experience isn't to give in to cynicism, but to embrace the pain and serve others all the more. Arthur doesn't deserve any of what happens to him, but unfortunately, entropy doesn't seem to care too much about who deserves it and who doesn't. There's no avoiding entropy, and we all get dealt our share of it one way or another. What really matters is what we do next, given the fact that we're all going to suffer. Do we throw up our hands, or do we embrace it, like Arthur, and strive to make life just a little easier for those around us? And this, as far as I can tell, is the real answer to entropy. Arthur Morgan is unable to escape his entropic fate. In fact, he doesn't really try to mitigate it at all. But through his goodwill and actions in the final chapter, he succeeds in reducing the entropy of countless people around him. A widow who would have died in the woods learns how to live. A family down on their luck in the depths of poverty gets another chance. And look at how he was able to give the Marston family a chance to escape the collapse of the Vanderlins. Thanks to Arthur, they were able to take a step back from the entropic mess that Dutch and Micah caused, and were given a second chance at life. We know from our lessons from the refrigerator earlier that reducing entropy in one place must come at the cost of an increase somewhere else. The really noble aspect of Arthur Morgan, the one that sets him apart from the likes of Walter White or Oconquo, is that he paid that price himself. He sacrificed his own life, his own energy. He willingly increases his own entropy to help others live just a little bit easier. Objectively, Arthur Morgan's story is tragic. His family falls apart, he is unable to overcome his illness, and he ultimately dies at the hands of someone he once considered an ally. But those who've played Red Dead Redemption 2, those who really resonated with Arthur, know that he is one of the most noble, inspiring protagonists out there. He may not have won the battle against entropy, who can? But he gave those around him the chance to stay one step ahead of it for just a little bit longer. Now, of course, it would be silly of me to suggest that simply helping others will circumvent all entropic activities of the universe. But it never hurts. Maybe Okonkwo wouldn't have fended off the English if he just stood up and helped his community, but he certainly could have helped his tribe to have a better future, to perhaps find a way to strike balance between the new and the old. Similarly, Walt could have spent his last days in peace with his family. He could have accepted help when he needed it and helped others when they needed it. Entropy is a scary, awful, terrible guarantee that barriers will always break. But it's not something that we necessarily have to resent. Through the chaos and the disorder, real creativity and original ideas can start to take shape. New, unique little structures that pop up amidst the compounding chaos. And really, that's all you and I are. Temporary exceptions to the rule of decay. By some unimaginable luck, while everything spins into nothing all around us, we wound up taking shape. In some sense, succumbing to entropy isn't a defeat, it's giving back what's owed. That process is hard to deal with, especially considering none of us asked to be here in the first place. But why make it any harder on each other? If you ask me and Arthur Morgan, the only moral action to take knowing that we'll all fall apart is to make sure our friends fall as soft as they possibly can. Our stories have acted for so long as our weapons used to fight back against pain and decay, but their blades have inevitably started to dull. The strongest weapon in our arsenal against entropy, it turns out, might just be compassion. So when the conquerors come to destroy your culture, when your empire starts to crumble, and when your family loses its way, when inevitably entropy comes to you, that crash of worlds, and you feel bitter like giving up, you know what to do. Stand up, and as much as you possibly can, with all the strength you can muster, stand unshaken.
Thank you.